How's it going, Ping Pirates crew? It's Adrian here, and we're back with another video. So today, we are going to be talking about every leader um, in terms of a tier list. I haven't made a video like this because I always kind of felt uncomfortable talking about every deck because I didn't have like a lot of experience playing with or against them. Also, there was just not enough data for me to kind of definitively say which decks are good and which decks are bad. But honestly, I feel like at this point, I have a pretty good idea of where everything stands. And also we've had a lot of data with the treasure cups and with all the regionals that were happening here in NA. I don't really like basing my tier list off of the Japanese meta because they could tell us a lot for sure, but you know, we really can't tell what is gonna be successful here until, you know, we kind of just play the meta out for ourselves. So with that being said, let's get right into it. Starting off with, I, to no surprise, I think Zoro is tier one. This deck was already really good in OP1. The only downfall of it was it had a losing matchup into Kid. But nowadays, it's feeling a lot more even with, with Kinemon and also with Kid uh, to an extent, just because this deck has gotten so much support that has trickled down into all of its other um, like avenues. So in OP1, the focus was just Rush. Like, I'm going to play uh, two cost Sanji, I'm going to play Zoro, and I'm going to play five cost Luffy, and then... I'm just going to swing at your face with these rush cards. And if you have the life, um, you're going to take it or you're going to give me like multiple cards. That was kind of the game plan of OP1. And that was pretty easy to manage, to be fair, like because they would swing at you and then that's it. Like if they protected that card, they're losing a lot of card advantage. And if you could kind of weather out the storm, it was really easy for you to just make the Zoro player run out of gas, have like one to two cards in hand every turn, and just poke them until they lose the game. In OP2, that is just not the case anymore because it's less focused on rush and more focused on just building this huge board that replaces itself. And what I mean by that is, you know, Zoro's best, one of the Zoro's best plays is playing Nami because she's a 2k body that you could swing with on a future turn. And also she replaces herself. So you have five cards in hand, you play Nami, now you have a body on board, and Nami has searched you out a card. They now have Curly Dedon, which is an absolutely insane card because it opens up so many options, right? Curly Dedon can search Nami, Nami could search something else, and then now all of a sudden you have two bodies on board and your hand is exactly the same. On top of that, Curly Dedon just makes the deck overall more consistent because now Gordon is like a four of where he was more of a tech card in OP1 to play against like uh, Captain Kid. But nowadays he is just in every single deck at four of because he's something you could swing with. He's something you could search off of Dedon. And then now he's like a, a removal card as well. So he's just this deck is honestly super crazy. It's really hard for other decks to keep up with how many things you have to swing on board. A lot of the, a lot of Zoro games is just swinging at their board until they have until they run out of cards, which is so hard to do for some decks because you're not going to swarm the board as much as they do. And then also moving on to Trafalgar Law, uh, this one is a little bit hard to say. I do think it has potential to be tier one, but there's just not a lot of players playing it right now. And it's also very difficult. So Trafalgar Law got pretty much the same treatment, right? It, you have the Curly to Dawn to search out Namis and Choppers, which is really nice. You now have Vistas, which can really help you out in the early game. But to be honest, like there's just a lot of decks that kind of check it i do still think it has the potential to be tier one so i'm gonna leave it here but you know you have to have a really good pilot for this deck and there's just so many different ways you could play it too which i feel like that's why it's most flexible and also i just think that this is going to stay at tier one for a long time this leader is kind of future proofed in that as long as there are good red and green cards coming out this like this leader is never gonna go away right it's kind of like the same thing with zoro like that leader skill is so generic that it's very i would be very surprised if they subbed out of the meta 
but yeah with flaw um it really just depends on the pilot and your matchups like this deck has a really good matchup spread though um i think it doesn't have like a super super losing matchup other than black and purple uh it could be very difficult to take the game from those two decks but it's not impossible right because of the resources that they have i just think that there's not enough people really playing this deck i i have a suspicion though that as the meta goes on you're gonna see more and more law because i feel like this deck is all about how to play around your opponent and how to combo your cards to kind of play around your opponent's deck as well so as people are starting to figure out this meta i think we're going to see a lot of law like we did in op1 regarding luffy it's kind of hard to say to me but i'm gonna put him in not competitive it's just really hard because red and green is an amazing combo and we've seen that with law but it's a lot different with luffy because he has that four life and usually when you have a four life leader you want really good defensive options which green has access to but luffy's leader skill kind of wants you to go aggro right so he's gonna restand a straw hat character give it plus 1000 you want to be aggressive with this deck because there's so many other decks that have better defensive options than you and five life that could close out games like kid right but with luffy his leader skill kind of promotes you to play more aggressively and that's very difficult to do effectively because you just at that four life you are so behind especially into like really aggro decks like zoro they are just gonna outpace you because you're gonna be giving up cards to save your life and those cards can't be used on your turn anymore and then you're just gonna be eating life and with luffy there's just no inherent card advantage because law is an amazing leader despite being at four life because you have the card advantage of red and green and then also on top of that you have amazing defensive options like five cost blocker law and all of your chump blockers with luffy you could technically run the same cards but you're not getting as much value as law does uh, whenever he plays his game because law's leader skill just you know it just ramps you so much dawn with luffy you don't have something like that resting for dawn just to restand a straw hat and give it plus 1000 is actually like a big commitment and doing because of that i just don't see this deck like really being that competitive unless we get some amazing straw hat cards but even at that point like i i feel like other decks would kind of make uh this one outshine so i i would be very surprised if um like anyone topped with this deck I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying it's very difficult to. And then in terms of Odin, um, I'm gonna put Odin at not competitive, mainly because there's just so many green leaders that you would rather play, like Kinemon and Kid. There's really no reason to play Odin over them. Odin's main strength, in my opinion, is you could be very aggressive and defensive with his leader skill because you could you know play cards like eight cost odin or uh six cost kinemon which is an amazing value card and that's only uh kind of it's exclusive to odin right and then you could also just have two dawn up to restand uh defensively i don't think it's good enough because really that two act that that two active dawn doesn't do enough on your turn because with Kid and Kinemon, it does so much on your turn and it gives you so much value. But with Odin, it's more of a reactive leader skill. So inherently, it's going to be a little bit worse. I feel like the more reactive leader skills are, it's harder to be successful with them because you want to be in the driver's seat. You want to be predicting and playing around your opponent. You want to you want your opponent to have to react to what you're playing, not the other way around, right? Because it's harder to like predict things like that. With Odin, it's harder to it's harder to find value with him because he just doesn't open a lot with two dawn and you're ditching a card to do it. Card advantage is just so important in this game. So you would just rather play like Kinemon or Kid. But honestly, he's not a bad leader in in my eyes it's just because the other options are so good 
there's just no realm where he'll be competitive unless he gets more support. And then, of course, uh, my favorite deck personally, we have Doflamingo. I think Dofi is tier 2. I think he's really strong right now, especially in this meta where, like, Kinemon and Kid players are... They're playing less and less 8-drop to the point where you might not even see an 8-drop if you're lucky in tournament. And that would be... And honestly, it's the only card that this deck loses to, in my opinion. You still have matchups that are bad like Kid and Kinemon. Odin is a really hard card to kind of maneuver around in the late game, but it is possible to do it by like recycling your blockers. Um, Kuma is a really good card to kind of combat like the Odin. And if you're being really aggressive with this deck, it's actually very difficult for the Kinemon player to come back because they're gonna need to ditch cards to protect their life. And if they don't have the eight drop, it's not gonna really fare them that well if they have a lot of cards in hand, right? Because their play, their like game winning plays are always very big committal plays. Like playing the Odin is a necessity for them. And then, and that, is pretty much their entire turn and also like a lot of people are running the seven cost kids this this deck absolutely craps on seven cost kid because of mihawk they're if they ever play seven cost they're losing a turn it's absolutely insane this deck has great matchups into whitebeard which is super important right now because you know, everyone's playing Whitebeard. You're swinging for 7k and you're developing something on board that demands a 2k counter from that Whitebeard player. And now they have to deal with uh, something on your board, which is very hard to deal with for Whitebeard sometimes because with, um, with those decks, you want to be swinging at your opponent's face as much as possible. But if you spend a turn like swinging at like a 6k Gecko Moria and it gets countered, that's a really huge loss for you. So I think Doflamingo is really good into this format. It has a pretty 50-50 matchup in Azoro, at least from my experience. I know that um, other people have struggled with this matchup, but in my opinion, it's not too bad because eventually the Zoro player is going to have to address your board. Uh, they can't just forever like swing at your face because they're eventually just going to lose the game if they do that. And that's really important because a Zoro player swinging at your board uh, means that they're using, they're using more resources on something that's not your life, which is super important. Uh, this also has good matchups into black. Uh, it could be very difficult if they have the Kuzan out, but honestly because black only has like a couple of different ways to pop your stuff it's very common for you to just like keep playing and keep grinding in the late game and they just can't deal with your board and to deal with your leader skill it actually takes a lot of cards out of their hand so usually they'll just take a lot of life in the early game um in terms of kaido blurple kaido i want to put this here <laughs> almost unplayable it's it's not only that it's just not competitive i just think that it's because of the choice of color like being purple it's very hard for this deck to find its place the leader skill is absolutely insane um ramping an active dawn every turn potentially is really strong but that four life is just so it's just so bad and the leader skill doesn't do enough for you on your turn to where it matters that much. You're going to see this a lot, but for for a dual color leader to work, the leader skill has to be worth it. Like it has to be insanely good. It has to do something like give you a ton of card advantage or give you a ton of board presence or whatever. Kaido doesn't really do that, and there's really no reason to play Blurple Kaido over just straight up purple. The blue, with dual color leaders as well, like it, it's important that your colors synergize with each other. And for Kaido, there's not really that much synergy between blue and purple, uh, like we see with other dual color leaders. Like red and green is honestly a match made in heaven there's like aggression there's mid-range it's great but for blue and purple especially for kaido leader skill you know blue doesn't have any ko effects it has bounce effects there's a lot of defense a lot of good defense and card draw with blue 
but honestly it doesn't really matter because a lot of the purple options are just really good and running like being able to run like a love love beam or a doflamingo uh blocker isn't really that worth it to warrant you going down to four life when you're playing pretty much almost like the same game that kaido uh regular kaido leader is playing so in my opinion not really a playable not really a playable deck for croc I want to say I want to say this deck has potential. This deck is really it's in a weird spot because theoretically I think it's very very good. I just don't think I just don't think enough people are playing it and this deck is amazing. I think its only problem is it just lacks that end game finisher, right? Because you're controlling the board and you're controlling the game state and the hand size. You're living throughout like the game, but what are you really like working towards? Like there's not that super great end game finisher like Odin, like nine cost white beard, uh, like Mihawk. There's just, it's so it's, it's difficult to close out games sometimes. And this deck is really good at grinding, but without that end game, kind of not like boss monster but without that end game finisher it could be really difficult to take games and granted like i think it it is really good to have like the you know the six cost kings with the 7k attack but in other than that like this deck just lives for a really long time but it's just not good enough right now i feel like if there if it gets more support which i know it probably will because uh, OP4 has a new croc leader that is also purple. So we might see some like cool new events, but in general, like I just don't think this deck, I, I think it has potential to top, but I just think it's less appealing to people because there's no like big end game finisher. And I, I don't really think we really need to talk about King that much. Uh, it's probably the worst leader ever printed. Um, I don't know why they thought this effect would be very good uh, you know you have to ramp up to 10 dawn and with purple all of your good cards are dawn minus effects have dawn minus effects so it counteracts your leader skill actively counteracts your game plan when you're playing the deck and also i feel like if it had like minus 1000 just blanket it would be pretty good but it's only on your turn which is only going to help you with like board control which as a purple player, like, it's nice, but you're going to be popping a lot of stuff on board anyway. But then again, if you're popping stuff on board, you are going Dawn minus one and you won't be at 10 Dawn to use the leader skill. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I think we all know that this leader is probably the worst in the game. And of course, we have Whitebeard. This is an easy tier one, especially after we've seen so many results from the regionals. This deck is absolutely insane. It is hyper consistent it is frustrating to deal with because of how long it lives and it's just really aggressive it just breaks the game honestly uh it, we're gonna see it a lot more in op3 as well with the moby dick ban um it, it does take a little bit of a future hit but i don't see that ever stopping this deck because you know you could run the you could still run the white beard version which is pretty much the straw hat version with uh all the white beard characters you could run marco there's like a lot of cool ways you could run this deck it's just insanely consistent and it has some of the best matchups into the other decks right because it has a pretty good zoro matchup uh if you draw like moderately well it has a pretty good kinemon matchup i think it's pretty favored against kinemon and for other decks it really struggle like other decks really struggle against it because it really ruins their curve having um, to attach that extra Dawn to swing. And then we have Garp. Uh, I want to put Garp on has potential, but honestly, from what I've seen, this deck is just not competitive. And I think the reason why is just because like red and black don't really have a lot of synergy with each other. Uh, I was talking about synergy between colors before. I don't see red and black having a lot. The only thing I can see combo wise is, you know, red has a lot of effects where if you have and i think this is kind of where they were going with this leader red has a lot of effects that if they have a dawn under it uh they do something really cool and you know garp's leader skill is if you attach dawn onto something 
you lower its cost. So I think that's where they were going with this. But honestly, it's just not good. It's too clunky from what I've seen. And it just loses a lot of games to a lot of the meta decks, right? You're running four life. You're, you're a four life leader. Uh, you're not doing a whole lot on your turn. And the red and black synergy just isn't really there. It could get better, I mean, with more support theoretically, but in my opinion, it's just not worth the four life. It's a huge deal to be at that um, kind of life threshold. And this leader is just, it's not really worth it. And then moving on to Kinemon, of course, this is a tier one deck. It had like the third most placements in regionals. This deck is hyper consistent. It You can cheat out some of these characters like a turn early. Cheating out Okiku on turn one is absolutely disgusting. Uh, it's one of the most one of the most oppressive things to play in the game and it's just hyper consistent like this deck is really good at what it does and that's like controlling the board in the mid game to uh dropping down that odin and just destroying people late game it has pretty good matchups into everyone there's no like one huge losing matchup and even go and it even has like a really good matchup into things it theoretically shouldn't like black uh from what we've seen with the pro play games uh chart i don't know if you guys see has seen that matchup chart but kinemon had like a 70 percent matchup against uh black smoker decks in pro uh pro play games online regional so this and i just think that you know this is also a deck similar to law where if you're really good at this game this deck is gonna serve you really well like there's a lot of room for skill expression and decision making which makes it uh which makes it really appealing for players that you know have the those really good fundamentals this is really a fundamentals deck if anything moving on to sanji i actually think this deck has potential um there now there isn't a lot of synergy between green and blue uh but there are a lot of options that pair really well with sanji specifically like the counter the counter events in green and blue are pretty good punk gibson is great uh love love beam is of course great but what i think makes this deck like pretty good is the fact that you could run green's film cards and honestly it's it could get really absurd i i've seen a lot of and I've played against a lot of Sanjis that run this film version. Like, they'll play a Brook plus a Nami or, like, a Brook plus an Usopp. They're swinging at you 5k each turn. And it just plays, like, it plays almost like Law or, like, Zoro, where they have this board that's swinging at you 5k. And it demands you take life or just have no cards in hand. And on top of that, if they could have multiple Namis out on the field, they're getting a lot of value because they're swinging at you 5k, you're discarding a card to uh, prevent that attack from going through. And then of course, uh, on your turn, uh, you, you get to search cards. So it's like replacing, Nami already replaces herself when she's played, but she's also giving you like plus one when she's attacking. And then just plus the extra Dawn you get. It has a lot of potential. I, I, I'm really excited to see like where this deck goes. I would not be too surprised if it topped like something somewhere uh, because honestly as this deck is in my opinion it's not as explored that much but um, as we go on we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see where it lands and then looking at Iv uh, Ivankov this is a tier 2 deck in my opinion uh, the, the, I'm not like ordering these in in any way but this is a tier 2 uh, it gets tops it's it's amazing like the the ability to just cycle right like to just cycle through your deck is really strong and because of the way it works like it has a really clear game plan right you want to counter out early and you're you don't get punished for countering out early because you're cycling all of these cards and then you want to transition into this like really strong mid to late game where you're spamming ivankovs playing the Luffy's, Ivankov's playing Crocodile, to where, like, it's kind of like a jacked-up version of Law or Sanji, where you just have these 7k beat sticks on the board that if your opponent doesn't address them in some way, they're going to lose the game eventually. And then, because you've countered, because you've countered so much in the early game, 
uh, you're gonna have like a lot of life and they basically just put you on a clock, right? So this deck is really interesting. It's really cool. Uh, and there's just a ton of ways to play it. I think the main thing holding it back is because is it takes a lot of effort to play it. And that is so important, especially in regionals and bigger tournaments. Like if it takes a lot more brain power, I, I don't want to say brain power because every deck requires like a lot of decision making. But with Iva, there's just so much decision making at times, unless you're playing that one deck that just like, you just kind of like discard your hand and draw cards go burr. But a lot of Ivankov players like playing the Dofi, they like playing the Perona, predicting what your opponent is going to play, and then shaping your turns and your future turns around it is a very common thing for blue players to do. And it's just very difficult because if you end up guessing wrong or making a mistake, that is your next like three turns stacked onto your deck. So this deck can be difficult, but I think it is worth it it's just super strong uh, at times, and it feels unstoppable if you don't draw the right cards into it. Moving on to Magellan, uh, this is a tough one for me. <laughs> I think Magellan is in between like tier 2 and has potential, but I'm going to put it in a tier 2 because of the recent results it's been getting and the waves it's been kind of uh, making. This deck is really cool. It's a pretty much new way to play purple where it's more of a mid-range deck. That That's pretty much the style of play that um, we saw in, I think, I, I don't remember which regional it was, but it was it was one of the online regionals. And it was all mid-range. You're not running any of like the nine cost or 10 cost Kaido. You still can, but uh, for the most part, you're fighting, making a big board, swinging out aggressively. And it's just really cool because the Magellan five cost is an absolutely insane card. When you play it, it's it's messing with your opponent's Dawn. And that could be really, really tough for a lot of decks to deal with, right? Because a lot of decks have set curves that are really important to them. And they have like these power turns that they're waiting to play. And if you're setting them back by one Dawn so that they can't do that turn, that is super, super important sometimes. And then also the on KO effects with the five cost Magellan leader are just insane, right? Going back to Dawn is even more important sometimes. Uh, there are ways to play around it, but they require you like don't address the five cost, which is really good for the Magellan player because then they, they get a 6k swing all over the place, right? So I think this deck is tier two, uh, maybe has potential, but because of the recent top, I, I do think this is a deck that we're going to see more often. People are kind of like believing it <laughs> to be a, a good deck. So uh, with that being said, like there's going to be a lot more testing and I, and I do think it's a pretty strong one. Moving on to Z, this is a very clear tier two to me. This deck is really good. It feels unstoppable at times, especially when you just draw the right cards. My problem with it is it's gonna lose to Zoro. It's gonna lose to aggressive decks really hard because if you're not able to come back, like there's just not a situation uh, ideal for you against the Zoro player, they have to draw really, really badly or be playing really badly uh, for you to win because Black already doesn't have the best matchup into Zoro because a lot of your removal is on these like little chumpy cards. Uh, so discarding a card is, is very bad. And especially for Z, going Dawn minus four to pop like a chumpy card also feels very bad. So it's very difficult to come back playing Zoro. And that's a tall order, right? Like you're you're bad against a deck that has had like what half the like almost half the players in a 500 man tournament play it. So it's very difficult to avoid um Zoro players, but honestly, like there are certain ways around it. You do have like the surprise factor of playing Z. They might be very unfamiliar with how to play around it but at the end of the day like i think this deck would be a lot better if zoro was just not in the meta if we're ever in a meta where like aggro is just not a thing which i don't think is going to happen z is an amazing is an amazing leader and an amazing deck because you just have so much removal and it solves one of black's problems where black has kind of two components to it right you have the cost reduction stuff and you also have the destruction stuff 
And a lot of the times the black players will lose because they have one and not the other. Like maybe they have the destruction effects, but they don't necessarily have the cost minus effects they need to deal with stuff on board. Z has both. So like you have, the, if you have the cost reduction stuff, you also have the destruction stuff because you have Z's leader skill. And the the power turns on this on this deck are absolutely insane. Like you swing so much tempo with it. So. Honestly, aggro is holding it back, but if we do see a like less aggro, more mid-ranger control uh, meta in the future, this deck can thrive. Honestly, I think so. Moving on to Smoker, I initially thought this deck would be like in tier 1, but now it's clear to me that this is definitely a tier 2 deck. Like, it's going to top some tournaments. It's very hard. I, I feel like it'll be very difficult to win with this deck, especially if the format is always going to be like nine round Swiss, uh, which is basically just like playing one round games until there's someone like undefeated. It's hard because it's not as consistent as all the other decks. Like even within like the tier two um, decks, like these, they're very consistent. Like Dofi, Iva, very consistent decks. The thing holding black back, in my opinion, is the fact that it doesn't have a lot of card draw. You don't have pretty much any card advantage uh, available to you that I can think of. And also, on top of that, your strong effects require you to discard cards. So you actually have less card advantage than most decks. So it's very difficult to deal with sometimes. Also, it's what I mentioned before. Like There are two components that you have to play in tandem with each other, which is the cost reduction part and the destruction part. But um, a lot of that is being solved in OP3. You know, we're getting consistency cards like Branu. There's a lot more consistent cards to play. And Luchi is like a pretty good leader. People are still playing the Smoker, but it's just, it's just not strong enough. Like it just doesn't have the tools, especially in the consistency and draw department that other decks have. And because of that, like you're going to lose a lot of games just to bad hands. Or to bad matchups like this also doesn't have the best matchup against Zoro, so it's very very difficult to play at times for luffy this is definitely very in between tier one and tier two i i think Zoro is the better leader just because you know it its game plan is a lot simpler and it's a lot more easier to execute but i do think luffy has its value because it's very good into Zoro, which is which is um, pretty important in this format. It's still pretty good against Kinemon. I think being a little bit slower than Zoro does, it does kind of hurt this deck a little bit because the thing that made Luffy really good into green was that a lot of kid decks back in OP1 revolved around like sitting behind the eight drop and luffy had a lot of tools to kind of deal with this eight drop because you could play a lot slower you didn't have to run out of gas uh that quickly but nowadays like kinemon decks are really fast uh you don't have a lot of tools to deal with the odin cleanly because you know like if you deal with the odin then you have to deal with the okiku on board afterwards which is a whole other nightmare to deal with right so this deck actually has like a worse matchup into Kinemon than it did in OP1 with Kid. But I do think this is really strong because you have that good matchup against Zoro. And you also have a little bit of a better matchup, theoretically, in my eyes, with Whitebeard. Because you could swing Whitebeard 6k every turn. It actually doesn't matter that Whitebeard is at 6k. Because you could always just attach that Rested Dawn onto your leader and swing. Which is super important for getting cards out of your opponent's hand. And... It's, it's just, it's got a lot of good matchup spreads, honestly. I think that's the strongest thing about Luffy is that you could kind of play it more uh, methodically. You don't have to go, you don't have to like go, go, go all the time in terms of your board like you do with Zoro. You could kind of think out your turns more often, which is really cool with this deck. Moving on with Kid, I, there's just, it's really tough to put these like in tier one or tier two, I think Kid is just outside of tier one. Like it's it's definitely a meta contender for sure. You need to be careful with this deck. But the other decks just have that, they just have that those tops and they have those results. For Kid, it's really hard to say because 
it's really hard to say like which one's better, Kinemon or Kid. But I do think Kinemon has the edge because playing a card like Odin a turn early is and like Okiku a turn early is just so much stronger than that double swing. The double swing is super important for sure, but it's only relevant in like a couple of matchups to be honest. Uh, Whitebeard is like a good example of this where that double swing really matters, right? Especially like since Whitebeard is like Kinemon um, is or the Whitebeard Kinemon matchup is Whitebeard favored because you know once you deal with a Kinemon uh, player's board, they're kind of done, right? Like they don't have rush, they don't have a lot of surprises. Kid always has that third of the double swing, which I feel like makes it really right behind, um, right behind Kinemon in that sense. Like they're just strong in different areas. You play the same cards, but I do think ultimately Kinemon is just the better green leader in general. Uh, but you know, with Kid, it's really tough. It's just really tough. I mean, you play the exact same cards. It's just a matter of like what leader skill you value. There's just not enough tops, in my opinion, to put it at tier one. You're not going to see a lot of kid in the meta um, right now. I feel like in the future, people are going to realize that, especially if Whitebeard is is going to be a problem, they will switch over to kid, uh, most likely. I feel like whether you play kid or whether you play Kinemon is mostly going to depend on like what the meta shapes up to be. Okay, so with Croc... Uh, with Croc, it's kind of tough to say. No one's really playing this deck right now, um, so there's not a lot of data on it. I want to say that it has potential, but I really just think it's not competitive. This deck has surprisingly seen a lot of play in OP3 because it has a pretty good matchup into Whitebeard. But in terms of our meta, I don't really see that happening. Strawbeard is just way too fast for uh, Croc players to deal with. And Blue right now doesn't have the tools that OP3 does, like 3000 Worlds. So it's just really difficult to... It's really difficult to succeed with this deck. But... And also, like, it's that, it's that thing where the leader skill just isn't... It's too reactive in a way where, like... It really depends on what your opponent plays uh, for this to matter, right? Because it's bouncing to your opponent's hand, which you might not always want to do. But in terms of removal, it could be pretty good. Like if your opponent plays Hawkins uh, and then you bounce it back. But that minus four Dawn actually matters like a lot in this deck. And a lot of the time you're going to be kind of choosing between what to do. And it's very difficult to control the game at times because of that. Like, I feel like Blue and Iva, I mean, sorry, Blue and Iva, Dofi and Iva are really good blue decks that are good at controlling the game state and the board because they have leader skills that are very proactive and that allow you to play more cards. Crocodile's slower game is a lot more difficult to transition into, especially in the late game. Like, it's going to be very difficult to keep up with a lot of their higher cost cards and because of that i just don't see this deck seeing a lot of success in the future uh i would love to be proven wrong croc i mean croc is an awesome leader i love him but it's it's just gonna be very difficult to deal with i think in terms of kaido this is a easy tier two for me uh this kaido got a lot of options like they got the hell's kaido has the hell's judgment you have sheer use to deal with um a lot of the aggro stuff in red but the problem is still that island like you like it you could definitely win games without drawing onigashima but it's gonna be a lot more difficult to do so and the games that you don't draw into onigashima just they're so much harder like it's just like such a like it's such a slog right and especially with so much zoro zoro in the meta and a lot of um just aggro decks in general that are just going to be swinging at your life it's it, it could be difficult to do even with onigashima right because you're spending your uh you're spending your turn two which should be a powerful play on playing the island and that could be very detrimental to you like in the future like you might take too much life to come back or it might 
take too many cards to protect from your hand and it's just very difficult to come back sometimes with kaido it's not impossible it definitely isn't and i feel like you're gonna see you're still gonna see a lot of tops with this deck and they're gonna be by the people that are like you know hot off draws like playing onugashima every game and that's another thing too this is a best of one format in most cases especially with the online regionals and the treasure cups like it's one round swiss so if you don't draw the onigashima in that round like your win rate just tanks and it's gonna be and with these tournaments it's all about just like being undefeated right so because of that because like this deck is also just less consistent than other decks it's gonna sit at this tier two spot if we ever get an animal pirate or like a beast pirate searcher that can grab onigashima i feel like this deck would definitely be tier one like but as it stands right now like the only consistency cards it really got was the hannibal and that just gives you more options uh to be more defensive in in like the early and mid game but unfortunately it doesn't fix that that glaring weakness of just needing island to to thrive in the game moving on to shanks <laughs> i think shanks is almost unplayable this deck is it's interesting um i really like the idea behind it like just having a bunch of film cards like on board and then going for like an insane like moby disc Mo moby dick esque like swing <laughs> but ultimately i think it's way too slow i think the film cards too just aren't good enough to play uh it doesn't have enough support i this deck could see play in the future if we have really good film cards that you know do a lot on their turns but in terms of like playing this deck you know it doesn't have a lot of ramp to it it might be very difficult a lot of the cards uh, a lot of the good film cards too require so much Dawn to use, like Douglas Bullet, um, Grand. I, I forget his name, but the one that draws you two cards is Dawn minus two. It's just it's gonna be very difficult to play this deck because the film cards are just not the best, honestly. But it this could I mean it it could have support in the future. That's the thing about these leaders, right? Like there's always hope in the future, especially for the. Especially for like the archetype specific ones, as because the, the leader will be pretty much as good as the archetype uh, they're playing around is, right? And then for Sakazuki, I think this is an almost unplayable deck. There's really no reason to play Sakazuki over Smoker. Smoker is just all around way more flexible, and with Sakazuki his removal is just so situational and you still have to discard a card which is pretty absurd to me you're pretty much playing worse kobe on your leader skill which isn't gonna come up that much um it's really only gonna come up in very rare situations that are gonna require like a helmeppo or a kuzan and then like or like a 10 cost kuzan so i i don't i'm not gonna spend too much time on this i do not think this this deck is going to see a lot of play. I just think it's going to always be outshined by Smoker and Luchi and everyone and any other <laughs> Navy card leader that comes out. But what do you guys think um, about this tier list? I didn't order them in any way. Uh, I don't really want to go through that. But this is what I think that our meta is shaping up to be, honestly. Uh, in general, I want to be proven wrong. I'm I I always love it when like rogue decks and pet decks come out to play. But what do you guys think? Did did I say anything that you disagree with? Let me know in the comments and make sure to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you on the next one. Good luck in any like work and school you're doing.